Apple spent a considerable chunk of its WWDC 2019 keynote talking about iOS 13, and with good reason, I would say. This is probably one of the most feature-packed iOS updates we've gotten in quite some time, and if you're watching this video on the day it came out, that software is finally available for you to use as a public beta. Now, if you're a classic Engadget reader, you've probably stopped listening to me and started downloading the beta already. Fine, have a great time. If you're still here though, I wanted to take a few moments to run through my experience with this beta, what I've liked, what isn't really ready, and what has to happen before iOS 13 launches later this year. So let's take a closer look. Before we go any further, the usual disclaimer applies. This is definitively non-final software, so if you install it on your daily driver device, that's, that's kind of on you. I wouldn't recommend it. I haven't had any really significant trouble so far, but I can't vouch for what might happen to you, so just exercise a little caution. I also want to bring up a few things right off the bat that you just can't really do with this version of iOS 13. And that's not because the software itself isn't ready, it's because some of the foundational stuff that needs to be in place isn't there yet. So sign in with Apple ID, for example. It's probably one of the features in iOS 13 and basically all of Apple's new software updates that I'm most excited about because I don't want anyone having my personal email address, even though I'm sure I flashed it by accident in a bunch of these videos already. That said, none of the apps in the App Store right now support it, so we can't actually try it. Ditto for fonts. You can't change your system font to something totally random, but you are able to do so on an app-by-app -app basis, but those fonts have to be contained in an app, which are not in the App Store yet. Now, with all that said, what's actually happening in iOS 13? Well, to start, dark mode is here, and it's actually really quite nice looking. I'm especially fond of the sort of dark mode wallpaper that comes by default. It's really, really pretty. It kind of reminds me of the Ubuntu colors, if that's a thing you're familiar with. You're probably not gonna notice a huge difference just by looking at your home screen. The uh, blurry sort of dock at the bottom is a bit darker, and that's really your only hint until you start swiping around and launching new apps. Music, photos, basically all of Apple's first party software has been adapted to dark mode and you're basically getting it across the board. Also kind of interesting to see that it's not just straight black everywhere. Apple uses subtle shades of gray when you've got different layers piling up on top of each other on screens. So it gives these things a sense of verticality and, and physicality that you might not notice in other versions of dark mode on other devices. It's a really minor touch, but I think one that kind of makes this dark mode feel less flat than other ones you might be used to. In addition to just sort of looking good, you can schedule dark mode to kick on after a certain time of day. And if you jump into the control center, you can actually quickly toggle dark mode from the brightness controls. So yeah, iOS 13 definitely looks a little bit different than versions of iOS you've used in the past, but I think more important are the subtle changes Apple made to how iOS works, how you interact with it. I think the keyboard is a great example of that. They finally enabled a swipe to type keyboard that I believe is called Quick Path. It's not a great name, but that's something that we'll revisit later because Apple kind of has a habit of using not great names, but it does exactly what it says. It works surprisingly well, and beyond that, some extra changes to how you handle text make using iOS much, much easier than it has been in recent years. So if you are just wanting to pop your cursor somewhere and edit some text, you just tap the screen. If you want to select stuff, you tap and swipe. If you want to undo what you've just done, if you've made a goof, three finger swipe to the left undoes that previous action. And that's, by the way, a system-wide gesture. So you're gonna be using that more than when you're just typing stuff and mess up. There are other little flourishes that are worth pointing out. The volume HUD now just sits on the side of the screen as opposed to sitting smack in the middle. And ditto for the silent mode toggle. Once you activate it, a little pill slides down from the top of the screen to show you that it's happening, but nothing more obtrusive than that. The biggest change so far, at least for me, has been voice control. And this is a feature that admittedly not a lot of you will probably use on a regular basis. It's mostly meant for people whose disabilities prevent them from physically interacting with a smartphone the way you and I might normally be used to. Instead, it gives you really granular, fine-tuned control over everything on the screen of your iOS device. And that's huge. Show grid. 11. 6. Four. I've been able to ask it to open Twitter and show me a grid so I can really zoom in tight on certain parts of the screen. I've been able to ask it for numbers so I can interact directly with elements 
on the display without me having to call it out specifically, there's a lot of power here. And I think it really could redefine how people with disabilities use devices like iPhones, but also iPads and Macs. Beyond all this sort of foundational iOS interaction stuff, Apple has also really thoroughly updated a lot of the stock apps that come in iOS 13. So Maps, for instance, benefits from a dramatic redesign. I'm told Apple basically redesigned its base map from scratch. So the quality of the map itself is significantly better than what you might be used to because Let's be fair, Apple Maps was pretty bad there for a while, if I'm honest. Beyond that, we're also looking at the addition of a few new features that kind of make it more palatable when you want to actually just start navigating. A new favorite straight, for example, gives you quick access to places you've saved, like home or the office, which is just kind of helpful. You can also now create collections, and this to me is probably one of the bigger additions here because I'm that person who very often is asked for a list of things to do in New York, and instead of finding the text document that I saved in a cloud service somewhere, I can also just now send someone my maps collection, which is surprisingly helpful, or at least it will be once other people use iOS 13. Photos has also gotten a pretty big redesign, and honestly, it's just, it's just kind of beautiful. I never thought I would say that about Photos, which in the past has always been this kind of totally functional utilitarian design and had some interesting machine learning flourishes that would surface different albums and collections of photos at specific times, but beyond that, it was just sort of fine. A lot of that machine learning sophistication carries over here because you do get curated collections for events and with specific people in them, which is always kind of nice, but it just as a whole looks better. The best example is when you're just looking at the default photos view and thumbing through your days because you get this beautiful edge-to-edge -edge grid of photos running you through what's happened in your life recently, which is actually just kind of pretty to look at. I've also been trying to stay on top of my life and my work a little bit better. So something like the new Reminders app should help out in theory. Now, I will say I'm a bit of a to-do-ist person just because it's cross-platform and it works better than Reminders did before, which realistically did not do a whole lot in the first place. But the ability now to tag people, have suggestions for people pop up in messages so you can remind someone that this is something that has to be done, to schedule tasks, the Reminders app, even if you've never used it before, is worth paying attention to now. I'm not sure it'll undo whatever allegiance you have to whatever productivity or reminder software you currently use, but don't sleep on this. This is actually really good. Oh, and there's Health 2, which has gotten some significant updates, in addition to a bit of a redesign that's powered by machine learning, so you do get the health data that pertains to you, or that the phone thinks pertains to you most right up at the top. It does also now track new kinds of data, like menstrual cycle information and your hearing health, which is huge, because my hearing is terrible. But now I can see what decibel level I tend to have my AirPods at, and how frequently I tend to listen to music that loud. And I'll even also get an okay or a too loud warning as defined by World Health Organization guidelines. It's surprisingly helpful. I don't see it really changing things for people who weren't already a little invested in their hearing health, but this is something that's very easy to stay on top of and could prevent a lot of heartache in the long run. So definitely keep your eyes peeled for that in the health section. Beyond all this, there's just a lot of really interesting small flourishes Apple baked into iOS 13 that make it just more pleasurable to use all around. You can now save files locally to the iPhone and the iPad, which is arguably more important, but we'll get to that in a different video. This is a big thing. This is something we've not seen in iOS before, and it really goes a long way in making iOS feel like a more complete computing platform. I can now download attachments from my email and save them in a folder that I've created inside another folder that I've created. These are very minute, mundane computing tasks, but they really do help the iPhone feel more capable, even if it's not something a lot of people are bound to use regularly. Also new to iOS 13 is the ability to silence unknown callers, which basically does exactly what the name implies. If you're the kind of person like me who are beset by spam phone calls, this should help pretty dramatically. My only regret is that I found out about this feature a little late, so I haven't been able to test it too much by the time you're watching this video. That said, if it does anything along those lines and has any impact on the number of people illegitimately calling me, I cannot endorse this feature enough. Oh, and if you're like me and you have to rely on your mobile hotspot a lot because you're just like running around all over the place, you'll be pleased to know that the hotspot is not persistent. So it doesn't shut off when your phone goes to sleep. So when you're sitting in a cab trying to write a story, something I have done more times than I care to admit in my life, you're not left up the creek. Thank you. We've gone through a bunch of things already, and frankly, there's a lot here. This video could easily be an hour long, but 
probably don't think that's the right thing to do for either of us. Now, since the public beta is so new, there are a few things we haven't really gotten a feel for. Siri and its new shortcut integrations, for example, CarPlay, because I don't have a car anymore. Apple's more pronounced push into augmented reality. These are all things that we'll get a better feel for down the road. And maybe we'll put together another video if that's something you really want to see. But suffice it to say, there is a lot going on here. So much, in fact, that really just feels like we're scratching the surface. There's a lot to like so far. I think there are still opportunities for Apple to sand down some of these rough edges, but in the meantime, stick with us. We're gonna keep digging into iOS 13 in videos and on Engadget.com, so thanks for watching.